thanks so much. It is a delight to be here, and thanks so much to, uh, to everyone who's made this possible. It really has been a, a delight. I'm sure we'll have a formal thanks uh, at some point, but I just want to just uh, say how, how wonderful it is to be here, particularly because last year I was supposed to be here, and I got kidney stones, which I do attribute to the fall um, <laughs> in a fairly powerful way. Uh, a programming note, I, um, do, I have even less PowerPoint than... than uh, Dr. Mu does, unfortunately. Um, I will be projecting a few Bible verses, but I've got so much to cover, it would just be a frenzy trying to go here, there, and everywhere. Uh, I will say, though, I do have a picture of my dog, Chizu, in front of a uh, boulder in the, the woods that says kindness, and I, I actually think that, that really uh, makes up for whatever other failings I may have visually. If you're wondering why there are boulders uh, in, uh, on the North Shore in the middle of the woods with inscriptions carved, I'd be happy to take that up at question time. <laughs> but we uh, have other uh, game afoot here, namely the fall and fallenness in the New Testament. Now, the fall, as a turn of phrase, does at least two things, one obvious, one less so. Uh, the obvious thing, of course, the uh, premise of this entire conference is that it marks out the goings-on of Adam and Eve in the text of Genesis 3, along with the ongoing consequences of those events. Humanity's fallenness, we might say, its state of estrangement from God. But speaking specifically of the fall, also introduces a metaphor of descent, however well-worn that metaphor might be. And so as we undertake an investigation of the fall in the New Testament, I'm going to discuss each of these aspects in turn, the, the fall as we customarily use the term, the state of fallenness, but also fall as a metaphor. Now, with respect to the primal sin of Adam and Eve, the New Testament references the event in only a handful of places, and of course there'll be some overlap with yesterday's New Testament presentation as I go through this. Now, this shouldn't surprise us because the Old Testament, of course, constituted the Bible for the early church, such that its stories and teachings did not have to be perpetually rewritten to count as scripture. Still, it's perhaps of some interest that references to the fall are far outweighed by the prevailing emphasis on the fallenness of people. The most obvious reference to the fall as a happening sits uh, within 1 Timothy 2.14, and Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a transgressor. Uh, the emphasis on Eve's transgression, of course, springs from the fact that Paul is here placing some sort of restriction on the teaching of women in Ephesus. Most of you will be aware that the precise meaning of this uh, restriction is much debated. Some will see it as an enduring global restriction on women teaching men rooted in the order of creation. Others as a localized restriction based on a lack of educational access for women at that time and that place. Still others as a prohibition of a certain kind of teaching one that lords it over uh, its hearers. Happily, we do not have to resolve that question for our purposes today, but if you are interested in a definitive account, I'm sure Dr. Mu will be happy to <laughs> sort that out, and his wife is here as well, so that really is a, a two for one there. Um, we, will be, we will be content to observe that Paul takes the story of Adam and Eve as instructive in some way for contemporary church practice, uh, we may presume, I think, that uh, he took this as an actual happening in the world, though the theological and pastoral points, whatever they might be, may uh, still stand if the, uh, it's taken in a more impressionistic or uh, allegoristic fashion. Uh, turning then to the second instance in the New Testament of uh, allusion to the fall, Romans 5 is less specific on details from Genesis, but clearly reflects the events of Genesis 3. Uh, Verse 12, which we've uh, gone over before, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through th sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Um, as we've seen, this text has proven uh, controversial down through the centuries, in this case because of the difficulty of translating the phrase epho pantas hemarton. Uh, I'm content with the NIV rendering because all sinned. The means by which sin entered the world through Adam is alluded to in verse 14, where Paul mentions the transgression of Adam, and that turns out to be the same word, parabasis, as we have uh, over in 1 Timothy. We would also note the crucial association in Romans 5, which uh, again has been a repeated point here between sin and death. For myself, I take death here to refer in the first instance not so much to the inner alienation from God 
uh, but rather to physical death as it is experienced in a state of alienation from God. So just trying to uh, refine that uh, perhaps ever so slightly. Both dimensions are critical. Our biological demise is crucial evidence for Paul of our fallen state, but that biological demise is experienced in the context of divine judgment. So we might theoretically disentangle Adam's uh, biological journey from his um, experienced death. Uh, the only Adam we know is the one who experiences it as divine judgment. The final explicit reference to the fall in the New Testament comes in Paul's discussion of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. And here we will bid Jesu adieu and uh, head over to the text itself. Uh, Paul begins his discussion of Adam in verses 21 and 22 in language reminiscent of Romans 5. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Uh, note again the emphasis on physical death, at least as I read it, as an essential part of our grim legacy from Adam. The context of resurrection makes this aspect of Adam's fall particularly relevant for Paul's purposes here, but as we've already seen, that was equally central to his discussion in Romans 5. Uh, Paul goes on to discuss Adam further in verses 47 to 49. Funny how the more things change, the more they stay the same. We've gone back to scrolling, just, just as they did in the first century. Um, so there, there we are. Uh, it's unclear, however, whether the fall is at the forefront of Paul's thinking here. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven, as was the earthly man. So are those uh, who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. Uh, interestingly, uh, with respect to our prior discussion of Romans 8, futility is also a signal theme in 1 Corinthians 15. He's got matthios, he's got kenos, empty, uh, he's got ak in vain. Um, so Adam's earthiness is at one level just... Uh, his constitutive framework. On the other hand, there's uh, maybe, depending on how we parse it, a little bit of uh, the fall lurking in the entirety of 1 Corinthians 15, not just those first verses we mentioned. Uh, we will return to this section later when we dig more deeply into the fall as metaphor. So, in addition to these overt notices of the fall, there are a number of texts where the events of the fall might perhaps lie in the background, and I may have even missed a few, but let me just give you a sampling here of uh, some possibilities. First, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Uh, even though it's most directly associated with Israel's post-Exodus experience in the desert, note the three quotations from Deuteronomy 6 and 8 in the, uh, the temptation narrative, uh, but the role of Satan in the proceedings hints that Adam's temptation might also be in view. This hint is especially strong in Mark, where the note that Jesus was with the animals may signal an allusion to Edenic peace before the fall, or perhaps a restored dominion over the beasts of the earth. There's almost certainly an allusion to Adam's story in Colossians 3, 9, and 10. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old man with its practices, and have put on the new one, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator." Uh, the mention of in the image of its creator strengthens the case that Adam is in the background, uh, and the idea that this old man is characterized by deception seems to point to the fall narrative in particular. Some scholars have posited a contrast in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, between Jesus' refusal to cling on to his divine status and Adam's desire to grab hold of God-likeness by eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I'm not convinced we need to read Adam into the text, but some people do, and so we include it here. Um, turning to Romans 1, Morna Hooker among, Hooker, among others, has seen the story of Adam lying behind the depiction of sin in Romans 1. Adam knew God, he desired to be like God, and thus became a fool. He lost the glory of God, he gave his allegiance to the creature, the snake, rather than God. Uh, it's an interesting case. Uh, if one were to grant that argument, however, and um, certainly a debatable proposition, one would have to note immediately that the actual story Paul tells in Romans 1 concerns multiple people, more specifically multiple Gentiles sinning, not one man sinning. And while we're in Romans, it's worth noting that Paul intersperses 
text concerning Israel's tragic failings with the Adam material, which we've explored in chapter 5. And while I don't know if I can demonstrate that Paul draws an explicit parallel between the two, he certainly could have done in light of the evident parallels in the OT itself between Adam's experience uh, and that of Israel. And uh, Dr. Collins touched on this, but I, I, I think that's really important for what we're trying to think through here is the fact that you've got Adam in the garden given a perfectly reasonable command. Uh, Adam, let, let, remember, created outside the garden, transferred into the garden, uh, given the commandments, violates it, and is sent effectively into exile, which is, is precisely the dominant story of Israel as it, as it plays out throughout the rest of the Hebrew canon. I, I just, in, increasingly impossible for me not to read those stories together. Um, however, one is going to sort, sort through that. Indeed, in, in a lot of my teaching in, in biblical theology, I label Israel Adam part two, uh, just because I see a, a really compelling point of comparison between those uh, two stories. Again, Adam's universality is, is critical. He, he's not expendable, as it were. Uh, uh, it's absolutely critical. But Israel is, is really rehearsing Adam's uh, experience, at least as I read it. Getting back to the New Testament, the description of sin in 1 John 2.16 has struck uh, a number of observers as quite close to the motivations of Eve in Genesis. You know the verse, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Uh, John does allude to the primeval history at a few spots in his letter, so an allusion here is quite possible. Uh, though, interestingly, the only named early transgressor is Cain, not Adam. And uh, tracing humanity's plight back to Cain in particular is, is something that happens arguably in uh, Wisdom of Solomon 2.24. Uh, another piece of evidence inarguable in Elvis Costello's early track, Blame It on Cain, which some of you may be familiar with, though I don't know if that counts properly as ancient evidence since it's from 1977, though... Some of you younger students, I suppose it does. Uh, not for Dr. Moo's Greek students, though, we learned yesterday. Um, as in Romans 1, however, any possible allusion to the fall as an event in uh, 1 John 2.16 lies in the shadow of the ongoing propensity of humanity to follow their lusts and pride rather than God's directives. Right? So even, even if Adam's in the background, it's contemporary human sinning which is in view. Uh, Dr. Collins mentioned... Uh, to me a few days ago that Jesus' statement that Moses permitted you to divorce because of the hardness of your hearts ties directly to conditions before the fall. Uh, Jesus says, from the beginning it was not so. And that last statement is of uh, particular interest since Jesus clearly wants the Messianic community to reflect the original tent of God's creation as evidenced in Genesis 1 and 2. And that, of course, has, has become a critical uh, theological factor in contemporary debates about marriage, et cetera, where some are arguing that, well, we're just looking eschatologically to uh, whatever it is we, we feel like doing at the end of the day. Uh, Jesus does, in fact, direct us back to the norms of uh, Genesis uh, 1 and 2. That's, that's uh, unmistakable. Uh, Romans 8, we've had quite a bit of discussion on that already, and I uh, align with those uh, who see that um, Adam's sin is not necessary, or the putative corruption of the created order in light of Adam's sin is not necessarily what is in view precisely in Romans 8. Uh, and in fact, uh, Lori Bratton has recently made a compelling case that this subjection to futility is not a once-for-all fall of creation, but instead refers to the ongoing groaning of creation as it bears up under continual human sin and the accompanying divine recompense. It's a really valuable article. That's uh, Bratton, B-R-A-A-T-E-N, first named Lori. If we, just for an instant, expand our purview beyond the human dimensions uh, of the fall, we might note in passing that the uh, presumed primordial fall of angels in 2 Peter 2, 4, and Jude 6 is also part of the New Testament landscape. Um, th these stories, of course, likely go back to the events preceding the flood in Genesis 6, so they're not, strictly speaking, a part of the seminal events of Genesis 3. Uh, nonetheless, in some uh, contemporary Jewish literature at the time of the New Testament, no notably um, first Enoch, the transgressions of the angels were a critical negative factor in early human history. 
And so we include it here for the sake of completeness. Well, so much for the fall as an event. What about fallenness in terms of how the New Testament images that and what effects it's, it's meant to have? Well, the story of Adam and Eve's transgression was well known and regularly rehearsed in the early church, but it's equally true to say that the New Testament writers were typically content to work for an assumption of humanity's estrangement from God without specifying how that state of affairs arose. And this shows up in ways too numerous to count. In my room this morning, I did the uh, digital equivalent of opening your Bible at random and, and just scrolled and stopped to see if what I landed on would ev evidence in some ways the effects of the fall. And uh, happily, I ended up in one of Paul's shipwrecks, which seemed like an unhappy prospect for my, my uh, supposition. But then I realized that the Roman soldiers wanted to kill everyone um, to keep them from escaping, which I think is a reasonable assumption that that's, uh, that's related to the fall. And then I can't even remember what the second one was, but trust me, it was, it was there. If we really run, run out of questions in question time, we could do that as a kind of audience participation. We'll blindfold someone, have them scroll through and, and hope we land on the, the fall. And the odds are that, that it will, in fact, transpire because it's just, it's ubiquitous. <sighs> The confession that Jesus died for our sins, kind of the, the obverse of the solution to this, is one ev evidence. The passion narratives, Romans 5, 8, 1 Peter 3, 18, Revelation 1, 5. We could go on and on and on, along with the concomitant offer of new life through the word. John 1, 1 Peter 1, 3, James 1, 18. All these presuppose a status in which we are at odds with God in some way and are in need of reconciliation. And as we've seen, the fact of human death was the decisive evidence that things are not as they ought to be. This plight could be articulated in a number of ways. Uh, we've laid considerable weight on the fact of physical death, but Paul could, of course, also speak of spiritual death. Ephesians 2.1, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, a thought echoed in Colossians 2.13. Uh, images of exclusion also cast light on our dreadful state. And this, this may be the most important one of all, as I'll argue later. In Colossians 1.13, Paul says that he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And, and in this case, we have this sort of double exclusionary metaphor in view. We have a transfer of kingdoms image along with uh, a light and darkness uh, contrast, a transfer from, from darkness to light. In a similar way, the Gentiles in Ephesians 2 are said to have been excluded from citizenship in Israel. They were far away, but have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. Uh, the story of the prodigal son puts this theme in dramatic narrative form. And, and if I can dip again just ever so briefly into the Old Testament via uh, Bart, one of my all-time favorite quotes from Bart here seen in, in the original Gothic script because I wanted to put it outside my office. I wanted it to look cool, but it's just a lovely, lovely evocation of, um, and, and that's from uh, Dogmatics 3.1, 3, 3, page 253. Um, more cannot be extracted from the passage because more is not offered than that it was a real place on earth, distant from and unique in relation to all other earthly places, yet belonging to the same plane so that real man could be there on the real earth and to this day cannot overlook or forget, but must always remember that among all the known and accessible places on earth, there was and is also that unknown and inaccessible place that in addition to his own place, there is also that which is lost to him and that that place is his home. Just, just exquisite as, as he uh, so often is. So, as are some images, and, and we laid particularly, uh, particular weight on the, the exclusion image there. Talk now about the effects of the fall. Those are, if anything, even more numerous. And while there's a certain dreary repetitiveness to disobedience, no sin is all that original, since by definition it lacks the divine creative spark, there's at least a surface variegation that uh, will keep the homardeleological uh, taxonomist busy. For that reason, I'm just going to tease out three representative areas upon which our writers lay particular emphasis. Uh, disunity, disordered desire, and as we have already seen, death. So, first of all, disunity. 
The fall not only ruptures the vertical relationship between God and humanity, it equally severs humanity's bonds with one another. And uh, Paul's vice list is in particular, his, his vice lists, difficult phrase to say, show a remarkable wealth of vocabulary for division and disunity. I mean, it's just, you can hardly keep track of the different ways he approaches that same fundamental problem. Probably most evident in Galatians 5, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. So while all sin divides people in some way, Paul sees divisiveness itself as a cardinal vice, an effect of the fall. Disordered desire is another ramification of the fall, uh, one that I think has particular relevance in the modern West. Contemporary society, we might say, has a default setting of affirming an individual's desire unless said desire uh, in its fulfillment has really obvious palpable negative effects on oneself or others. The default setting of the New Testament is almost entirely the reverse. While not all desire is condemned, let me be careful to state that, Jesus himself earnestly desires to eat the Passover with his disciples, and that's surely a good thing. But the typical Greek words for desire, epithumia and hedone, are typically viewed with suspicion. This is in part due to the fact that the verbal form of epithumia shows up in the Septuagint as a translation for covet in the Ten Commandment passages in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Paul quotes this in uh, Romans 7. Uh, but the New Testament's generally negative assessment of desire flows equally from sober reflection on what fallen human beings typically desire. Our wants are so far off from God's design that they are, as it were, guilty until proven innocent. If you see desire hanging around a street corner, you can assume that it's up to no good. Let's consider, uh, as our first example, James's assessment of why disunity, specifically uh, in chapter 4, the radical disunity of warfare is so pervasive. Why is warfare pervasive? You desire, epithumete, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, zelute, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures, hedone. Paul is equally damning in Romans 1.24. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another, especially when we note that the word sinful is added by the NIV translators. Paul himself simply wrote, give them over to the desires of their heart. And the RSV captures this by translating epithumia there as, as lusts. Uh, we can compare Titus 3.3. Uh, 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, epithumies, uh, kai hedones. As for the last category, death, we've um, spoken about that uh, numerous times already, and so we'll skirt over the topic here quickly. Would that it were so easy to skirt over the thing itself? Death remains the preeminent sign that God's displeasure rests upon humanity. And here again, thinking of death as it is experienced uh, in the context of divine judgment. And uh, the verse I would bring uh, to bear here is John 8.24, which is, is spoken to a specific group of people who are bent on Jesus' Jesus's death. Nonetheless, I think it presupposes a, a pretty dim view of the human state. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. As I've said, we would exhaust ourselves were we to track every instance where the New Testament signals the ongoing reality of fallen humanity. Uh, the modern notion that we are basically fine as we are is contradicted by the scriptures at every turn. And I'm sorry to report that uh, uh, amongst the modernists who run afoul of scripture here are, as uh, our friend Pooh, um, <laughs> Tigger's all right, really, said Piglet lazily. Of course he is, said Christopher Robin. Everybody is really, said Pooh. That's what I think, said Pooh. But I don't suppose I'm right, he said. Of course you are, said Christopher Robin. Well, no, actually, Christopher Robin. He was right to say he was wrong. Um, <laughs> we've, we've learned some positive things. 
Unfortunately, uh, we all need a little correction, and, and here they've fallen into a fairly major error. So, <laughs> scriptures speak about what we habitually call the fall um, all, all over the place. Whether the metaphor of fall is of the most preferable, however, is a very different question indeed, and one to which we now turn. So the fall as metaphor. As I've indicated, the words of the fall are so readily identified with the events of Genesis 3 that we rarely probe the metaphor in play. Falling, which entails some sort of downward motion, whether it's falling from a high place to a low place, or at a minimum, falling from an upright position to the ground. That's a minimal requirement, I think, for what it means to, to fall. Now, we're hardly going to expunge the fall from our theological vocabulary, but it is, I think, worth probing the phrase a bit to see whether it fully captures the New Testament's portrayal of our standing before God. I must say that the story in Genesis 3 itself doesn't do much to encourage the language of fall. I'm aware that some suspect... Uh, Ephraim the Syrian being one, that Eden was a mountainy place, but the text itself suggests a horizontal movement out of Eden. There's more a sense of exile from than descent from. The only place in the New Testament where a physical fall of human beings might be present is in Revelation 12.4, where in a vision, the dragon sweeps a third of the sky, stars from the sky. Like everything in Revelation, the passage presents massive challenges of interpretation. I think it's most likely that it refers to the persecution of Israel under Antiochus Epiphanes, though whether that fall represents martyrdom or apostasy is very difficult to say. In any case, we hardly want to build an entire uh, theological edifice uh, linguistically on this one precarious verse. Satan, of course, falls like lightning from heaven in Luke 10, 18, and is thrown from heaven in Revelation 12, but he's not a human being, so it doesn't count. And interestingly, even unrepentant Israel in Romans 11.11 11, is said to have stumbled but not fallen beyond hope. Explicit use of the, uh, one of the fall words there. In the New Testament, the most relevant batch of material would seem to be those many texts that posit a juxtaposition of a heavenly status versus an earthly status. Here we have at least some sort of height distinction which might, in theory, make the language of a fall useful. At times, this contrast is put forward in quite economical fashion, as when James contrasts the wisdom from above with the wisdom from below, and without further ado, labels the latter earthly, epigaios, um, along with unspiritual and demonic. Uh, but we'll investigate in a, in a little more detail four places where the contrast is more developed. 1 Corinthians 15, the Gospel of John, the book of Hebrews, and the book of Revelation, a place we always turn to to get clarity on any, on any doctrinal matters. At least I, at least I do. Um, I, I wish I were joking. Um, we've already seen that 1 Corinthians 15, and farewell to the Puvian heresy there, um, is one of the few New Testament passages to trace our state directly back to Adam's sin. Our concern now, though, is with the development of the Adam theme in the latter part of the chapter, where Adam's earthiness is particularly in view. Um, picking up the action in verse 44 or so, we've already read it once, so I won't reread it, but you've got it up there uh, for your viewing pleasure. The question at this point of Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15 is not so much Adam's sin, but rather his place in the divine program. Uh, the Greek word taxis, or order, is crucial throughout the chapter, particularly in the grand overview of creation and redemption in verses 20 to 28. Uh, the natural body we inherit from Adam is meant to come first in God's ordering of things. It's not intrinsically evil, though Paul will argue that it's corrupted through our sinful proclivities. And this is a really fun point to notice um, back in verse 33, uh, people tend to take this uh, quotation, um, bad company corrupts good morals, as a kind of throwaway line. I think it's actually very important to Paul's argument. He throws it in there as if, as if it were a casual, but he has quite deliberately used the word corruption here to show that the corruptibility of Adam is not simply uh, an endemic uh, feature embedded in his uh, existence per se. It's been adapted, uh, adopted in uh, his, his sinning. Uh, the, the bad company, as it were. Just to, to reference another 
70s band of, of far less uh, significance than Elvis Costello. But I digress. <laughs> Taxes, order, uh, corruptibility. Adam's earthiness, and this is critical for us, is not the result of a primordial fall from heaven. Earthiness only becomes a problem when it's caught up in the satanic ec economy of radical autonomy where humanity attempts to shut God out and earthiness descends to idolatry. And so the problem in 1 Corinthians is thus remaining in this now corrupted earthly state and refusing to embrace the heavenly upgrade on offer through the spirit of the risen Christ. Let's turn now to John's gospel. As you're well aware, John's gospel is full of dualities, light and darkness, God and the devil, death and life. The most notable duality for us is the distinction between heaven and earth. Because again, that would give us the possibility of some, somebody falling in, in, in that sense of the metaphor. Uh, one could really frame the entirety of John's gospel uh, as a question of whether a person will embrace the heavenly reality now made known in the incarnation of Jesus or whether one will remain in a purely earthbound horizon. This often emerges in the text by way of John's trademark irony. Nicodemus, uh, Nicodemus puzzles over Jesus' exhortation to be born again or born from above, depending on what you make of the word anothen. can mean both things. Jesus offers the woman at the well eternal life in the spirit, but initially she can only envision a limitless supply of literal water. Jesus' interlocutors at the feeding of the 5,000 are scandalized at his offer to give them his body as nourishment, not recognizing that he's again speaking of life in the spirit, which will be made available through his death on the cross. The failure to discern the spiritual significance of these earthly images represents a continued imprisonment in the cosmos. This world that is on the one hand the good, viewed as the good creation of God and the object of his ongoing concern, and at the very same time is viewed as the corrupt world system which opposes God at every turn. Jesus, meanwhile, repeatedly insists on his heavenly origins. It's just right straight through the text. I won't give all the, um, all the uh, instances for the bread of, God is, bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven, gives life to the world. I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. I'm with you only for a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. But despite the prevalence of this heaven-earth dichotomy throughout John, a fall from heaven is not, strictly speaking, on offer. Jesus certainly descends from heaven, but this is, of course, the condescension of divine love, not any kind of a fall. More critically for us, Jesus indicates that he's the only one who's come down from heaven. No one has gone into heaven except the one who's come from heaven, the Son of Man. That's John 3.13. Indeed, the metaphorical momentum throughout John is one in which we move from good earthly realities to better, more enduring heavenly ones. As the bread of life, Jesus uses the earthly food as a gateway to understanding the eternal nourishment he offers. The wine at Cana is a foretaste of the messianic banquet to come. The water in the well points towards the spirit whom Jesus will give. Human beings, in the same way, properly begin their existence in the earthly sphere, in the same flesh that Jesus shares. The problem is an inability or an unwillingness to move on to the next level. Hebrews operates in a similarly dualistic mode to the extent that some have regarded it as a platonic piece of theology. I think that goes a little far, though I'd concede it's at least Platonish. That's how I speak about Hebrews. But as in John, the point is not that Hebrews began, the Hebrews. As, as listeners began their existence having fallen from a heavenly status, but rather that they have attained to such a status through their faith in Christ. Right? You've come to Mount Zion, the assembly of angels, etc., etc. Now, they're indeed in danger of falling away from that status should they apostatize, or to put it slightly differently, they're in danger of not fully realizing that status by failing to persevere until they reach the Sabbath rest of the people of God. But such a fall or falling short is subsequent to their experience of Christ, not prior to it. Um, very quickly to the apocalypse, with all the hermeneutical problems that attend that magnificent text, I just want to focus on one isolated thing here. Um, leaving aside vexed questions of when and what 
uh, the vision's concern. Instead, focus on the fundamental dichotomy throughout the book between the inhabitants of the earth, back to Isaiah 24, as we'll see, uh, and those who belong to God. The saints are regularly depicted uh, with God in heaven, in the fifth seal, they're seen as awaiting their deliverance and cry out, how long, O Lord, elsewhere uh, in chapter 7, chapter 15, they're shown worshiping God either subsequent to their death, I, th I think that's probable, or in the, the ultimate fulfillment uh, of all things. Uh, what's crucial for us that is, is that in John's vision, the phrase, the inhabitants of the earth, does not simply designate all the people who happen to live in the world. The phrase instead isolates in the visionary material those men and women who endure the divine wrath. As I indicated, it likely derives from Isaiah's little apocalypse in chapter 24, which begins, see, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He'll ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. <laughs> I think the appeal of that passage to John should be pretty obvious. And so in keeping with what we've seen in prior passages, the earth dwellers are not faulted for falling from heaven. Rather, the problem is they remain earthbound and enthralled to the beast because they don't heed the warnings that come from God in heaven. The saints, meanwhile, equally begin their sojourn to the holy city on earth, but they are the ones who maintain their commitment to the Lord of heaven. Their steadfast identification with God is rewarded with a heavenly status that begins now as consummated in the eschaton. So while they're pictured on earth in the New Jerusalem, the outpouring of God's glory uh, in Revelation 21-22 renders any strong distinction between heaven and earth moot. So heaven sort of joins to, to earth. Well, what might we say by way of conclusion about the fall in the New Testament? On the one hand, the traditional teaching of Adam and Eve's transgression and its ongoing effects is affirmed throughout the corpus. The story itself is alluded to on only a few occasions, but its prominence in the Pentateuch means that it would have been well known and accepted by the New Testament authors. While the origin story of estrangement from God is seldom referenced, however, the reality of humanity's state of sin is pervasive in the New Testament. On the other hand, the metaphor implicit in the expression the fall does not really map squarely onto the New Testament's own range of expression. The writers rarely, if ever, portray humanity falling away from an original heavenly state, as one might glean from the phrase, and as indeed is the case in some Gnostic or Neoplatonic accounts. Earthly existence per se is not the fundamental problem. The problem is that people are living towards death as a result of their sin and are thus threatened with a descent to the grave whence there is no return. Furthermore, when the opportunity arises to move upward with Christ into the presence of God, many refuse the summons and declare, like the murderous misfit in Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find, I'm doing all right by myself. If we are to speak of falling in the New Testament, it's more appropriate to apply it to believers who are at least nominally raised with Christ, but who fail to persevere in their faith and in that sense fall away from God. As I've indicated, if we had to choose a dominant image in the New Testament for our state before God, it would probably be that of exclusion. But the exclusion doesn't have quite the same ring to it as the fall. Sounds like a failed Netflix series or something. Nonetheless, both the Eden story and the architecture of the temple suggest that God's presence is principally available on the horizontal plane to humans. Even if we might say his proper manifestation is in heaven, he is available on the horizontal plane of the created order. Though, in fact, we know they're cast out from his presence, Eden, or they have only a limited representational access in the temple. And of course, the temple is wonderful because it, it, it has a veiling, unveiling, exclusion, uh, welcome wrapped up into its whole being. You could look at it one way and say, what, how wonderful that we have access to the presence of God. And you could look at it another way and say, oh, how, how tragic that we can't get in except one guy once, once a year. Thus, Critiquing the metaphor of the fall, not the content of the doctrine itself by any means, um, this has at least one salutary consequence for biblical theology. And this is very much in keeping with what Dr. Collins was sharing earlier today. It helps us return, uh, retain the original emphasis in Genesis on Adam and Eve's need for progress, or progress for our Canadian friends. 
They're not created as constitutionally immortal beings in an already perfected world. They're creatures who need to move towards immortality. We might say move upwards towards immortality and join with God in laboring to bring the creation project to its goal. But of course, that would involve in the first instance a horizontal movement into the creation as they fulfilled the command to fill the earth and subdue it. Their desire for radical autonomy complicates matters considerably. But as 1 Corinthians 15 makes clear, Christ comes not only to remedy the rupture that has arisen between God and humanity, he comes to lift believers into eternal fellowship with God through the gift of his spirit. I want to conclude with an emphasis on this dynamic of progress with the uh, story of the man born blind in John 9, which is just one of my all-time favorite, favorite stories. I, I love it so much. Um, and, and just so appropriate to the conference because as Jesus encounters this uh, legatee of, of the fall here, this, this, this poor chap, the, the seminary students all want a theoretical explanation for what's going on, right? Uh, and let's, you know, we, all, we all do it. Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Uh, but, but Jesus is, is not going to accept their premise. He's, as so often, he's going to answer in a way that's quite tangential, oblique to the presenting problem because he's addressing the real problem. And here, if I may, uh, I'll just preach. Jesus is not concerned with where this man has been or why he is in the distressed state he's in. His concern is how to move him forward from where he is to where he can be in Jesus. And if that sounds a little revivalistic, blame John and not me. That's what this story is. It'll, it's just a wonderful, wonderful story in that regard. And the best commentary on John 9, I'm going to go on a limb, the best commentary ever written on any part of the Bible ever <laughs> comes from Irenaeus' explanation of why Jesus peculiarly chooses to use mud to heal this man's eyes. Here's the one PowerPoint I have. It's my, the best piece of theology ever written outside of scripture. Why does he use mud? Translation's a little old, a little clunky, but the truth will shine through. Why did he do it? Wherefore, also the Lord spat on the ground and made clay and smeared it upon the eyes, pointing out the original fashioning of man, how it was affected, and manifesting the hand of God to those who can understand by what hand man was formed out of the dust. For that which the artificer, the word, had omitted to form in the womb. Is there a bolder theological move than that? But he's got to deal. He's dealing with that plight of the blind man, not just theoretically, but here it is. He's got to say something. He says, what the word had omitted to form in the womb, he then supplied in public that the works of God might be manifested in him. In order that we might not be seeking out another hand by which man was fashioned, nor another father knowing that this hand of God, meaning Jesus, which formed us at the beginning and which does form us in the womb, so he goes to primal creation, the creation of every individual human being, has in these last times sought us out who were lost, winning back his own, and taking up the lost sheep upon his shoulders and with joy restoring it to the fold of life. So it's, it's, it, it's good and proper. We meditate theoretically about how we got to where we are, but the good news of John, the good news that Irenaeus shares in such a beautiful way is it's not where we've been, it's where we're going in Christ. So, thank you very much.